for helping to develop the professional uh, as a professional development offering for the Citizen Science Association. I want to bring your attention to some upcoming opportunities. So the Citizen Science Association, if you're not familiar with the Citizen Science Association, uh, we started back in 2014 and membership then was free. And at that time we ended up with more than 5,000 members from 81 countries. And then earlier this year, we started having the membership uh, have a paid option. So we have non-paying members and we have paying members. And so this webinar is one of the benefits that we hope to offer those who are part of our organization as paying members. And then non-paying members can join uh, each webinar as you saw, some of you might have paid the $7 fee to join today as a non a non-paying member of Citizen Science Association. So we welcome all of you, glad you're here. Uh, to give you the lay of the land for today and broad picture Citizen Science Association, let me share with you uh, our mission and vision. So we work to develop the practitioners of Citizen Science, whether that be people who are program coordinators or researchers or evaluators or um, other people who are kind of doing the management of Citizen Science and we want to advance citizen science across the globe. And so we envision this world where science is, uh, it, where people are understanding and participating in science worldwide. And we hope that we can start to do that um, again through our, our conference, uh, some of you may be familiar with, as well as this webinar series and other uh, trainings and workshops that we hope to implement over time. Since we want to have this series of webinars over time, uh, one of the things I wanted to draw your attention to, if you didn't already see it, on our website, which is citizenscience.org, there is a blog post. So down in the lower left corner of your screen, there's a series of blog posts that come out on a regular basis. And the one that has to do with the webinars that we, we got you to connect to today, there is a place there for you to give your ideas of what you would like to see for future webinars. So I encourage you to give us your ideas. Uh, and we want to have uh, one a month is the goal. Uh, over time. Uh, we'll share with you at the end of the, the webinar what we have in store for December. Some of the webinars will be for non-paying or paying members where, and will be free for everyone and others will be like today where there's a, a charge. So next month's will be one that's free for all. So what we want to do today is we want to have 45 minutes or so uh, with our presenter who I will introduce in a minute and then allow you time to ask questions and have those questions answered. So we have muted everyone to try to minimize disturbance for the presenter for Julie. And what we're going to use is the Q&A feature of this Zoom system. So you'll see uh, on my screen, it's at the top of the screen, it's a Q&A. Uh, and you can enter your questions in there and then we'll, Julie and I will work to address those at the end of her presentation. We wanted to ask you one poll question before we get started. And I'm going to launch the poll so you can, should be able to see this. And I'm going to check with Julie. Can you see it? I can see it. Okay. So, so folks who are on the call in the webinar, if you would be so kind as to answer the question of, of um, what's your citizen science affiliation, that can kind of give us a lay of the land of who we have on the call. Chris, do you want to work on the host element? I will do that. Okay. I'm not sure if I can actually do it while I'm sharing this. Oh, okay, cool. I may have to do it right after, right after I'm done sharing the screen. All right, it looks like answers have been coming in and coming in, and it looks like we've kind of settled in. So it looks like we've got about 71% uh, are citizen science project coordinators. Uh, about 7% are people who do research of citizen science and uh, two people and then a couple people are citizen scientists or volunteers themselves and then there's some folks who are in the, that other category. So someday I'm going to find out how to, to let you put in what that other is um, but today I, 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 unless you put it into the, the question and answers or the chat I can't find out how that is. But I appreciate you answering the question and I am going to end that poll. Sharing the results. And 
then I will stop sharing. All right, so I am going to turn this over to Julie. So Julie, do you want to pull that? Sure. All right, and I'm going to work on our next All right, Chris, can you see my, my screen? Yes. Awesome. OK, well, uh, thank you all so much for joining today's webinar on volunteer engagement and retention. I'm Julie Bastine, as Chris mentioned, uh, and I'm the director of the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, or ALARM, which is housed in Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So it's super exciting to be a part of the inaugural webinar series for the Citizen Science Association. Um, to give you a sense of where we're gonna go for today's agenda, we are going to be very careful about time. Um, so within this hour, we're going to review some different topics related to volunteer engagement. So this is the agenda I'll do a little bit about Alarm and who we are, and then these are the different segments that I think about um, as I cycle through the volunteer engagement wheel. And we'll, I'll be chatting for about 30, 35 minutes, and then uh, we want to create a lot of space for uh, question and answers. And I should qualify this and say that uh, when I typically do this workshop, it's usually in person, and I usually do it over the course of an hour and a half to two hours, and it's a little more interactive. So where I'm gonna be focusing primarily on the content of this workshop uh, for today's webinar. A little bit- you make your video work now. Oh, should we try that? Okay. Mm. Yeah, I'm having trouble bringing that up. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to bring that up while sharing my screen. No worries. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. So now you guys can see I'm in one of our student offices. Okay. So a little bit about the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring. Um, so we are a program housed in Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Um, we are a combination of full-time staff, a part-time, uh, our founder, Dr. Candy Wilderman, is our part-time science advisor, and then we also employ uh, 12 to 16 Dickinson College students uh, throughout the school year. Um, and I always like to point out, just like a lot of programs across the country that do community-based science work, we are 40% supported by the college, but just like the rest of you, we also uh, go after grant dollars as well, and so we're 60% supported by uh, grants. Um, our goal as an organization, we work with volunteer monitors. So we're in that aquatic branch of citizen science, water quality data um, is the emphasis of our programs. And so our mission as an organization is to empower communities with scientific tools to monitor, protect, and restore uh, Pennsylvania waterways. Um, and primarily that happens by working with folks in collecting water quality data. Um, for those of you who are international uh, on the line, I went on ahead and then helped identify where Pennsylvania is in the United States. So we'll see you over there on the mid-Atlantic part of the country. Um, this is a map of ALARM's work over our 31-year history. And throughout our 31 years, of operating, we have had uh, experiences with the three different types of citizen science models. And so on this map, if you see where the blue dots are, uh, that represents our acid rain monitoring program. That was more of a contributory model uh, where we as an organization, at the time our name was Alliance for Acid Rain Monitoring, we set the research agenda, the question, and our community partners, our volunteers, collected water quality data on pH and alkalinity, and then they submitted the data to us uh, for use. And so those data were used to help inform Pennsylvania Acid Deposition Control Acts. Um, Pennsylvania has very acidic rain. 
Um, one of the things we found as we were doing our acid rain monitoring program is a lot of our volunteers had questions about their water quality that grew outside of um, acid rain. And so um, we shifted our operational approach in 1996 to work with communities from the ground up in a co-created model where the community partner defines the research agenda, develops their monitoring program, um, collects the water quality data, analyzes the data, and does data interpretation and data communication. And ALARM's role is a service provider. We provide mentoring at each stage and step of the scientific process. So on the map, when you look at this, those areas in green represent the small watersheds, uh, drainage areas for streams, um, where we've worked with communities using that co-created model. Uh, the yellow on the screen um, represents areas where we have done shale gas monitoring workshops and the pink dots represent sites where volunteers are collecting water quality data where shale gas extraction or fracking has occurred um, in the state. And I'll talk a little bit about that as a case study in today's webinar. But throughout these different operational models, uh, we've had very diverse experiences working with volunteers and engaging with folks around volunteer engagement and recruitment and retention. And so some of those lessons learned I'll be sharing today. Um, as an organization, the primary areas where we provide support to communities is along those water quality monitoring lines. But in the lay of the land of Pennsylvania, we have over 500 community-based organizations um, that engage water quality issues, and the average budget of those organizations is less than $3,000. So a lot of these community-based organizations are 100% volunteer. And so when they're connected with the service provider or someone who's providing them with different types of assistance, they tend to ask you for support that is outside of like your specific realm. And so one of the things that we saw as an organization, especially in the early 2000s through today, is that a lot of our community-based partners needed assistance, um, programmatic assistance on topics like strategic planning, volunteer recruitment and retention, as well as fundraising. And so that's where uh, our motivation with coming up with these resources came from. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this, but you know, as we know and with working with volunteers, you're gonna have a natural ebb and flow. And you know, a lot of times with our community partners, there's either a question or a concern in the community that brings people together uh, to engage in water quality monitoring efforts. And then as they resolve that issue or you know, the issue has gone away, um, then you see that ebb and flow of a dip in activity. And that's often at the point where a community partner will reach out to us and say, hey, we need support around strategic planning and volunteer recruitment and retention. So um, one of the things I wanna ask everyone to be thinking about um, with this slide is looking at your own citizen science project. Think about how you operate it and, you know, is it a new project? Is it a sustained project? Is it something that's been around for a couple of decades? And I want you to ask yourself, do you have a strategic plan organizationally? Do you have a, a, an operation plan that you check in on on an annual basis? Um, and within that annual work plan, where is the role of volunteers fitting into that? Is there a specific area within your annual work plan that specifically focuses on the role of volunteer recruitment and management? The other question I have for you all is to be considering your annual budget. And when you look at your annual budget, where does volunteer management um, fit into that? Does that fit in with a, a line item with supplies? Does it fit in with staff time? Um, but right from the beginning of thinking through volunteer recruitment and engagement, um, these are some things that I think are really good to be considering organizationally is coming back to those building blocks of clear planning and figuring out where the role of volunteers intersect with your organization's mission or your project goals. Transitioning from there into volunteer planning. Um, so once you've established that strategic plan and your annual work plan, um, that helps to establish that clear vision for how volunteers help you achieve your organizational goals. 
The other thing that's really important in your annual planning process is to make sure that the, your organization has that buy-in. You see the purpose of volunteers, you see the role of your citizen scientists, and everyone you know, has a shared value about the meaning of volunteers and the role they play in achieving your organization or your project mission. The other thing in your volunteer planning uh, that you have to consider, as I've already talked about, is making sure you have the resources to fully support your volunteers. That means the budget dollars for equipment and staff time for folks to do volunteer coordination, um, to thinking through professional development opportunities and things like that. So in your annual work plan process and your planning out the role of volunteers and helping to achieve your mission, these are three things that I like for folks to consider. There's a lot of myths around volunteers. Um, the first and foremost is this idea that volunteers are free um, or you can't invest in voluntary efforts. And that volunteers only want what you want, or this idea that volunteers do not need professional development. So these are some common myths that you see being highlighted in some of the, the literature around volunteer recruitment and engagement. Um, the thing I really want to highlight is volunteers are cost effective, but they are not cost free. Um, we see this time again with our community partners when they're thinking about the role of volunteers and be like, oh, well, volunteers can, you know, uh, develop our website and, you know, do the fundraising for the organization and, and you know, do all the monitoring activities and the restoration activities. And while that's true, volunteers can play a role with that. Um, it's important to make sure that you have the infrastructure to support your volunteers with every project that they are tackling. And so, again, um, this is something that uh, a lot of folks in our field are constantly talking about is the fact that volunteers are cost effective but not cost free. Um, so when you're thinking through your volunteer planning, there's again the things that you need to have in place. First is that strategic plan, having that volunteer work plan, making sure that you have a volunteer manager at slash coordinator. Um, commonly when I do this workshop at conferences and things like that or regional areas, it's the number one thing that people don't have as a volunteer coordinator. Is there someone on your staff within your community-based science team that is devoted to working with your volunteers? If you do not have that in place, that is something I would strongly encourage to be your takeaway from today's webinar, is to create the space for that role within your organization. And last but certainly not least, making sure that you have that volunteer budget, that budget in place to support your volunteers. There's a couple of really fantastic resources out there. One of my favorite guides is the guide that I have on the screen right now, which is the Strategic Volunteer Engagement, a guide for nonprofit and public sector leaders. Um, this is the RGK Center. Um, so I have the link at the bottom for where you can find the PDF of this. And there's a line in there that while volunteers operate without receiving compensation for the work performed, they still require a strategic vision, outlay of time, attention, and infrastructure. So again, it's just underscoring this point that you don't engage in a volunteer relationship without making sure that you have those fundamental strategic building blocks in place um, to set your organization and your project goals up for success as well as your volunteers. One of the beautiful tools that I see, uh, and this is a worksheet within the appendix appendices of um, this guide, is this great volunteer involvement framework. Um, and uh, just to spend a little bit of time on this, I think when you're setting out and you're designing your community-based science project or another project um, within your organization that uses volunteers, this is a great way to be thinking about things. Um, so. Along the side, you see your time for service. Is it short term, is it episodic, or long term? Um, so, for example, with water quality monitoring, um, you know, macroinvertebrates are can sometimes be, you know, looking at bugs and using them as indicators for water quality is the type of thing that you do once a year, you might do it twice a year. So that's an example of an episodic volunteer monitor who can come out, you can get your team together um, to collect bugs at your different sites throughout the watershed. They can come out, help with the identification. Um, 
Um, and that might be the only type of monitoring they help out with with the organization. Um, Long-term volunteers, for example, with the way how we operate, would be like our chemical monitoring volunteers, like those folks that are doing monitoring on a monthly basis or in some of our programs, a weekly basis. And with that, you really need and you look for volunteers that are willing to collaborate with your organization for a long period of time um, to get that year's worth of data or two years worth of data um, at a particular site based on what you're monitoring question is. Um, so that's an example, episodic or long-term. Another thing that's really common in the watershed field are like the volunteers that come out for tree planting and restoration events versus folks that, um, you know, do things like chemical monitoring and things like that, episodic versus long-term. Um, the other type of volunteer that you can have is the connection to service, which is going across the top here. Sometimes folks, when you look at their motivation, they are motivated um, based on the affiliation. It's a cause they believe in. It's an organization they believe in. And as a result, they want to show up and be a part of that. Um, the other side that you see are folks that have specific skills um, that they're looking to put to use in their community. Um, so we've seen some examples like with this, um, with our watershed associations, like those folks that are like, hey, I love building websites, let me build your website for you. But they don't necessarily have that like connection to what the, the organizational mission is. Or um, perhaps, you know, for folks that have done tree plantings, when you do tree plantings, you have to do a lot of mowing. And so you might have someone who um, has a, a, you know, a tractor or a mower and is willing to, you know, offer that skill to the community partner. But again, it doesn't necessarily, um, they're not necessarily motivated to be attached because of the affiliation to the organization. Um, and one of the things that the guide talks about is that, you know, these aren't exclusive categories. You can have a volunteer here intersect with an organization in one box um, here within the volunteer involvement framework and you can see them go around and engage with all the boxes two of the boxes um, and so forth so it's, it doesn't mean that just one volunteer that a volunteer only fits into one box over their period of volunteering um, some other things to be thinking about with your volunteer engagement strategy is thinking about ways to have your volunteers have access to diverse experiences. Um, so perhaps, you know, you know, they're connected with like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and they have all sorts of different types of projects that um, folks can uh, interface with, with their Nest Watch or um, the Project Feeder Watch and things like that. So there's different ways that you can engage folks in your, in your projects. Um, another thing to be thinking about is not just diversity of options and engagement, but also thinking about that layer of involvement within the organization. Maybe you get someone hooked, um, you know, coming out to a single macroinvertebrate identification workshop, but maybe they later become the volunteer that is spearheading a tree planting, or maybe they're their volunteer that eventually becomes a chemical monitor. Um, but, you know, make sure that there's different, and maybe three years down the road, they become the volunteer coordinator or the equipment manager. Um, so it's important when you're thinking through your volunteer engagement that you have different layers at which a volunteer can interface with your community-based science project. And again, thinking through short-term and long-term um, opportunities, because sometimes folks like folks participating in the diverse projects offered by Zooniverse, maybe they have 30 minutes over their lunch break where they can contribute to identifying animals in the, you know, uh, in Africa or, you know, identifying galaxies and things like that. Or you might have volunteers that are willing to, and able to um, commit, you know, 10 hours a month to a cause or data collection and things like that. So thinking through short term and long term opportunities. Um, again, you know, just think when you're thinking about those short term versus long term volunteers, you know, it's an equal amount of investment. Short term volunteers don't necessarily mean that 
they don't require a time investment. Someone coming out for an episodic event or like a one-time thing, um, it still takes time to create an enjoyable experience for them. So one versus the other doesn't necessarily mean less time. Um, the long-term volunteers, you, there is definitely a, a volunteer management process with that. And I thought there was a really interesting quote um, that I saw in some of the literature, and that is that volunteer turnover impacts an organization like staff turnover. And that is absolutely true for um, especially some of those long-term volunteers that have been interfacing with the organization or their local community group for a really long time. Um, at the end, if I have time for case studies, I'll, I'll share that, um, but we've definitely had lots of lessons learned through our different uh, volunteer monitoring programs, but I'll save that for the end if there's time for that. Um, getting into volunteer recruitment, um, there's a couple of, of important tools to be thinking out. So, so we've already talked about volunteer planning, the role of creating that strategic plan and your work plan and where do volunteers fit in. Uh, something that comes out of that is coming up with your different job descriptions for your volunteers um, so that folks know what it is they're getting into. So for example, for our fracking monitoring program, we have a job description. It's like, you know, six bullet points. And in there we have things like you know we expect you to it's expected that you go out in all weather um, you know it's a weekly basis or a bi-monthly basis um, depending on whether or not there's fracking in the area and we always ask people to sign on for a minimum of a year um, and then at that year point give them the opportunity um, to uh, you know re-up and so job descriptions give a sense as to what it is folks that people are getting themselves into and they can be like, ooh, maybe I'm not into, um, you know, wading into a creek and doing X, Y, and Z and with critters or something like that. Um, but at least they know going into it, oh, this is something of the job description I feel very comfortable with or something I don't feel comfortable with. Um, it's also an, an opportunity to place people appropriately with the volunteer role. And so I have this picture on the screen, which I think is really funny. Um, we were in a situation where we were collaborating with a community partner and doing a tree planting and the volunteers they had were 300 little league players uh, that ranged in age from five to 14. And um, in this picture, like the five-year-olds, thank goodness they weren't volunteering for very long because to actually get the task done, um, there were a lot of fun, a lot of great pictures and photo ops, but when it actually came to like getting trees in the ground, we had to match uh, more, some of the older baseball players uh, did that a little bit better um, than our five-year-olds, but it was still a lot of fun regardless. So again, thinking through the appropriate placement of volunteers within your program. Um, I thought this was really interesting looking at reasons why people volunteer um, and I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind um, is that people come to the volunteer table and the citizen science table from a lot of different perspectives. Um, maybe it's a cause they believe in. Um, maybe they do it to feel a sense of accomplishment. Um, something that we're hearing time and time again is that people are volunteering to find and meet new people and make new friends, um, which I think is really interesting. And, and when you think about connectors at that local level. Um, and something that um, we are seeing a lot of, um, we, as an organization, Alarm tends to have um, older volunteers, but especially back in, the, in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, when we had an economic recession, we saw a lot more people um, just out of college or just out of high school volunteering so that they could um, build skill sets. And so that's something else to be thinking about um, when you're coming up with your volunteer opportunities. Um, there's lots of different challenging volunteer scenarios out there. This is a point in time where I sometimes will share experiences from my, my own um, volunteer moments over time and some things to put out there like when you have a new person 
at a meeting or perhaps you have like a new person that's never, you know, interfaced with citizen science before or something like that. Regardless, if someone's new, make sure you have someone in your organization that's going and welcoming that person um, to the project and giving them an orientation and lay of the land. Um, that's like the number one reason why people don't come back to the meeting the next time is they didn't feel welcomed or felt like there was a place for them. Um, so thinking about ways to welcome new people is really important. Um, with volunteer engagement and I'll save some of these other stories for the end if there's time um, volunteer recruitment strategies again it gets back to those building blocks knowing your organizations know what you want uh, with your volunteers looking at skills and time frames that episodic versus long-term volunteers um, and then you know those types of things will help inform a recruitment strategy and how you get the word out about your opportunities um, and again you know making sure that you have that volunteer coordinator someone who's following up and uh, you know reaching out to those new folks that might be involved with recruitment, there's a lot of different active, passive ways um, that you can do that. Um, and obviously with different size projects, which I know are represented on today's webinar, some of these are gonna be more applicable and, and some not. Um, so we still find um, with some of our community events that newspapers and are a great source of uh, information for some of our uh, volunteers and finding out about opportunities. So get those press releases out, let people know that you're looking for volunteers. Um, we have, uh, yeah, I can get into stories of that. Social media, you know, again, we've seen some really great um, examples around the world of how social media has been able to galvanize communities to show up for events and things like that. So definitely, you know, taking advantage of that is really important. Um, something that we do on a very local level when we're trying to find volunteers or if there's a community group just getting started is to have that community group think through their web of influence. You know, I am a person that's showing up for this particular reason, you know, collect water quality data, but, you know, I might also be a birder. I might also be involved with a civic organization, or I might be a master gardener or something like that. Have the people at the local level, your community partners, think through everyone that they know um, and all their affiliate organizations and use their web, use their sphere of influence to get the word out about um, volunteer opportunities. Um, some things that I personally, as an organization, I've had mixed um, success with is um, public fairs and events. Tabling uh, to get the word out um, isn't quite as uh, useful for us as it used to be, um, but you know, you still see folks doing that, especially on the local level. It's a great way to get your name out and let people know of opportunities. Online, uh, there's some really great websites to, to advertise um, your volunteer opportunities, volunteermatch.org, idealist.org. Um, one that I came across recently, points of, of, of light.org. Um, but last but certainly not least is Size Starter. And in December, there will be a webinar um, by Katherine Hoffman talking about Size Starter. And it's a really great place for practitioners to you know, put descriptions uh, about your own projects to let people know how to interface with your project um, for those specific folks looking for citizen science. Um, so again, if you want to hear more about Size Starter, sign up for the next Citizen Science Association webinar, uh, December 7th. Um, volunteer management, again, make sure that you have that volunteer coordinator, have those job descriptions in place. This is showing up really fuzzy on my screen, but we do have a, a volunteer position template that we use when we're coming up with our our uh, volunteer job descriptions for the first time. Um, but those clear start and end points, I think, are really important uh, for volunteer management. Um, and again, getting back to that new volunteer, the first time someone has submitted data in a project, what does that look like? You know, maybe you're a Cocoa Raws volunteer that has gone out and collected weather data, rain gauge data for the first time. Is there a welcome process as you're logging in and setting up your site? Some of this is, hey, thank you. Um, what else are you interested in? Um, for us, working on the local level with, with communities, it's a great way for um, a volunteer coordinator to have conversations directly with their volunteers. Um, 
orienting them to the project and the organization, ask people about their motivation, what brought them out there, um, survey their skill sets, ask what they would like to get out of volunteering. And through that intake process, you're able to start your two-way communication process, which is really important for retention purposes. Um, when you open up that doorway for two-way communication, uh, it also allows the space for additional care and feeding of those volunteers. You know, what is their opportunity for providing feedback um, to the organization or to you as a project manager? Some different volunteer scenarios that we run across. Um, we will see volunteers disappear and we'll see volunteers being disgruntled. Um, and I think, you know, it's just sometimes when a volunteer disappears, there's a reason for it. You know, maybe they are feeling neglected by the organization or perhaps um, they're, you know, they have uh, needs elsewhere in their life that uh, require their attention. But regardless, if you know you have a volunteer that's disappeared who had been very uh, faithful in collecting data or participating in your project, but suddenly stop, you know, reach out, give a phone call, reach out via email and be like, hey, you know, how's it going? You know, blah, 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 set up that two-way communication to make sure that they feel like they're still connected and that creates the space for them to say, you know what, oh, I broke my leg and I can't get out to the stream for a couple of months, but I plan to get back involved in a couple a month once I've healed or um, someone might be like, hey, I've got like, you know, a sick relative and I need to take the time to focus on, on the family part of my life. When you have a disgruntled volunteer, when you reach out and check in on them, um, that get, again creates that space for that two-way communication. And we have found that when a volunteer is um, feeling disgruntled, that having an opportunity to talk and share their concern share their concerns or share why it is um, that they're feeling upset often helps appease the situation and it gives you the opportunity as a project coordinator to receive feedback about the way how your program is being run and how it's being received by your volunteers so you know reach out to those volunteers who disappear or disgruntled um, one of the things that I keep finding in the literature is this whole question of like can you follow a fire a volunteer and you know I think there's also something to be said for being like hey maybe the volunteer is not the right person for your organization or maybe not the right person for that aspect of your project. Um, as a water quality monitoring organization, we have our volunteers go through a quality assurance process to make sure that they're using their equipment correctly. And sometimes we have volunteers that, you know, regardless of additional training and tips and, and all sorts of types of feedback to try to help them pass quality assurance, Sometimes they never get there with some of the parameters, or maybe they never get there at all. And so instead of, you know, so for some of our volunteers, we might drop off a couple of parameters that they won't, that they don't monitor so they can focus on the ones that feel really comfortable to them. Or, you know, maybe that's a great volunteer to help with data entry or help with a different aspect of your program. Um, so if data collection isn't the role that they play, maybe there's another place within the organization where you can match their skills in with your needs. Um, so putting that out there. Um, so again, just like with any project, you want to make sure that you're assessing your volunteers and also assessing the impact that your volunteers are making as a part of the project. Um, volunteers like to hear that. How do they connect to the mission of your project? Um, you know, what was their data collection able to do? Um, and if they're not using the data on the local level, how do you care about the data and how do you use the data? Perhaps um, their site got included as a part of a study that you did, or perhaps, you know, their site got highlighted as like a primo location for uh, you know X Y and Z aspect of your citizen science project um, I think it's really important when you're working with citizen scientists you know to have a place where uh, folks can document the hours that they're contributing to your project and so I saw this for the first time with the Georgia adopt the streams uh, database um, where they had a spot within their data form where people People logged how many hours they volunteered. Um, oftentimes, funders will ask, you know, what's the return on investment? And so, you know, for your staff time, what did that result in, you know, in relationship to the volunteer time and their results? Um, so make sure you're capturing that. So 
you know, in our shale gas program, you know, we have 5,000 data points and we estimate that that's about 2,500 hours that people volunteered collecting those data. Um, you know, talking about that impact is really important. Um, the other side of that too is, especially with our shale gas program, you know, even though our volunteers are using those data to like find a pollution event and get that reported, they're also really curious to hear how else other people are using the data within the database. So for those of you who have data where folks can download it and take a look at it, you know, track your downloads, track like the most interesting spot um, that people have called and asked for data. Um, you know, we get some really interesting requests from folks um, uh, in North America and in Europe and we've gotten some inquiries from Africa and our volunteers love hearing about that. So, you know, track those stories and make sure you get those stories back to your volunteers. Um, and last but certainly not least, you know, just make sure you're demonstrating and sharing those stories of impact of how a volunteer collecting data within your project or contributing to your community-based science project has resulted in change. Maybe it helps identify an area where restoration could take place, or you know, maybe it identified a faulty sewage system and that was then replaced. You know, communicate those impacts um, back to your community partners. Um, oftentimes, you know, looking at reasons for why volunteers burn out, um, that often comes down to folks having an unclear role um, or feeling as though they don't have a way to a voice within the organization. So, you know, if you're making changes to your program and you're like, oh, maybe like we've, we're considering this now with one of our projects, like, oh, you know, we don't necessarily need to capture this data or this type of parameter for this question. You know, how can we, you know, what's some other things that we could add in? If it's going to impact a lot of folks and, you know, they've been monitoring in a certain way, you know, include them in the discussion. Don't make assumptions about the volunteers. Get their feedback. Um, when volunteers can play a role in the decisions that affect them, um, that helps that retain those volunteers even throughout a transitional period. Um, and again, you know, making sure that volunteers have a clear sense of what they're signing up for. Um, you know, if you say that, you know, doing this particular project will take eight hours in a particular weekend once a month, you know, make sure it doesn't take more than that. Or if you say something's going to take 30 minutes once a week, you know, again, make sure that it doesn't take more than that um, so that your job description matches what their experience is. Um, again, looking at uh, volunteer retention, there's some fun resources out of the Corporation for National and Community Service. Um, in this uh, uh, article that they have, they say one out of three volunteers who participate one year do not continue the next, which actually, if you flip that around, that's, you know, two thirds of people who volunteer continue the next year, which I think is really exciting and really cool. Um, but they have some fun stats um, within uh, some of their documents. Um, one of them is looking at retention and looking at volunteer hours. Um, so if you look at, you know, volunteer retention by age. Um, so again, a great document to take a look at. Um, uh, within the age range, you can see that the, the key areas was um, 35 to 65. But, you know, I mean, it, like, actually, it's, you know, 35 and older is a pretty great target for volunteering. Um, and then the number of hours that people contribute, like, I often get people being like, wow, you asked your volunteers to, like, you know, spend seven hours a month monitoring or 10 hours a month monitoring. And then, you know, when you look at some of these volunteer hours per individual, um, you know, some folks are volunteering more than 500 hours of their time on an annual basis, which I think is really cool. Um, go volunteers. Um, and again, when you're thinking about retention, getting back to some of those, those tips I offered earlier, um, change it up. Make sure that, you know, folks have opportunities to engage in different projects um, under your organization or if they're like, you know, and once they get hooked with one type of citizen science data collection, you know, maybe they'll go into size starter and find some other projects in their area that are kind of similar or, you know, tangentially related. But, you know, if you can't change it up, 
suggest other ways that they can like build and add to their experiences. Providing those leadership opportunities are really important. I love some of the stories we see working with our community partners where, you know, someone might turn out for tree planting and then that's their hook to like check out like another event and maybe they start monitoring and then, you know, they really get into monitoring and then they're like, I'm going to be the equipment manager and still monitor my site. Or the, and then after that, they become the volunteer coordinator. And we've seen some of our volunteers like climb the leadership scaffold of their watershed organization onto the top where they're the president and you know I just think that that's really important to cultivate and create those um, opportunities for folks to you know grow within their volunteer positions again effective feedback is really important and then of course recognition is super important um, with your volunteers and figuring out ways to like you know acknowledge the amount of work people have done in your projects um, just gonna like go through a couple of these really quickly, um, just to be cognizant of time for Q and A. Um, and just a note to folks: if you do have questions um, you want to discuss, be sure to use that Q and A function within the Zoom webinar system um, and type them in, and and we'll get to them in a little bit. Um, but uh, this guide has 101 ways to give recognitions to volunteers, and some of it might work for your citizen science projects, and some might not. Um, you know, those six months check in for those folks where folks are interfacing with your database, um, build those um, equations into your database, be able to capture like, oh, this person has just hit an anniversary and you get notified or they get notified. Um, or, you know, maybe, you know, they've done, you know, have celebration markers for number of data points they've entered or number of galaxies they've identified. You know, think through those, those ways for someone to be like, woohoo, I'm like, you know, earning badges or something like that within in the system. And if you're in a situation where you can, you know, interface with your volunteers directly, you know, have an annual volunteer celebration. You can even do that online um, if you have like a, a vast geographic area that your program covers. Um, you know, making sure you have those coordinator check-ins um, to give folks a chance to say, you know what, I've done this for two years and I'm going to call it. And every time a volunteer tells me, oh, you know what, I'm going to call it. And they always say it a little timidly and trepidatiously. And I'm always like, great, that sounds wonderful. You know, make sure you thank people for the amount of time um, they, they volunteered. And again, letting them know how useful those data were with concrete examples. Um, again, I've already talked about some of these tips for acknowledging volunteers, those database prompts, creating those spaces for people to share stories, um, provide those leadership roles, say you thank you, say thank you and we miss you is really important as well. Um, just one couple of things to leave you with um, as we come into the home stretch here, bringing it home. Um, this guide is really great. I strongly encourage it. It's the Urban Institute, the Volunteer Management Practices and Retention of Volunteers. And there's this, there's this line in there that gives me pause because it says, um, you know, charities are receptive to best practices in volunteer management, but commonly adopt them only to some degree. So in short, we know these things about volunteer retention and recruitment, um, but we don't necessarily always take the time to fully adopt them. And I raise my hand as, as someone that does that as well. Um, so it is, it was this interesting indication that like we do know the best practices for retaining our, our citizen scientists. Um, and you know, it has some, all these charts showing like some of these different things that we all know and we've adopted to a large degree or to some degree. So, you know, check that out if you're interested. Um, I've uh, included the links for all the resources I've used specifically in this presentation. Um, so hopefully that can, people can click on that afterwards um, to get those resources. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess we can open it up to questions. Um, and Chris, we can talk about all the different webinar opportunities at the end. Does that sound good? Sounds great. That was fabulous. Thanks, Julie, very much. So if people do have questions, there's this Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can click on and you can type in your question there and we can uh, get that answered for you.
Do you have any questions, Chris? I was going to comment on the fact that I think that there's value in this. I was thinking about it in terms of our association and uh, our board and our working groups and making sure that we say thank you. So if there's any uh, working group members or board members on the call, thank you for your time. And uh, we will be working to get some, some great new uh, connections for, for everyone to be part of, of those. Um, I have a comment that from Shelly Rose says, thanks so much for sharing these resource, resources. Uh, and a question from Danielle Doria asking, can you go back to the 101 ways to acknowledge volunteers slide, please? Hey, you already did it, because you can apparently see these too. <laughs> yeah, and again, um, there's a laundry list of these ways to recognize uh, volunteers within this document, and some of them apply and some of them don't. Um, but I also think just getting your project team and some of your volunteers in the room um, together is really important just to brainstorm what are some ways that we can say thank you that's authentic to your organization. Great. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so you can see these questions then as well? I can. I have them pulled up. Okay, awesome. So there's a couple more here. Uh, so Robin asks, what is a suggested frequency of giving recognition annually or after doing X number of tasks? Um, I think that that can be, I, should, I would say both. Um, so I think that a anniversaries are really important things to acknowledge. Um, and it's kind of like when you hire a new employee, there's like that three months, you know, check in and then there's the six months you know, review to say, and then after that, you're, you're doing your evaluation on an annual basis. I think that rule of thumb also applies to volunteers, you know, making sure that there's, you know, a, a way to check in a little bit more frequently within the first year, but after that, making sure that you're, you're acknowledging those annual um, anniversaries and things like that. And um, in terms of the, the number of tasks or data contributed, um, you know, something uh, sit side at or Greg Newman developed our shale gas monitoring uh, database and I think if we had a little bit more money we would have loved to add in some of those badges that people could collect you know after submitting you know 10 data points that got a badge and after that 50 um, so you can know or in relationship to your program what is an appropriate way to acknowledge some of those milestones with data contributions and Chris, I can't see all the questions now. Okay, so I have one from Mariana Baris, who says, very interesting, thanks for your presentation. Water chemistry monitoring requires lots of commitments by volunteers, quality of data collection, time commitment. Uh, can you please elaborate on how much do you invest in alarm on training, mentoring, uh, following up with volunteers? Oh, awesome, cool. Um, oh my gosh, it's a very time intensive process. Um, so we've used different models for different programs. Um, so for our shale gas program, that's more of a collaborative project um, where it's a standardized protocol. People you know, monitor the same things. Um, so to get started, we always have a scoping meeting and phone call with folks um, and then we set up the training and then there's like a, a period after a couple of weeks where we're doing follow-up and then they're going through QAQC and then our shale gas program our community partners are minimum of three hours away from us and so we've really had to use uh, new technology to be able to stay in contact so for that once a volunteer is like you know connected to the program um, they have the option of connecting to uh, conference calls that we do every quarter. Um, and then we have a volunteer, someone who manages that project and they spend about a day and a half a week um, working with our shale gas volunteers. And as a part of that, we try to do one to two inch person visits to those um, volunteers throughout the program. So that, that gives you a sense of that. So uh, for that program, we have 125 volunteers, give or take. Um, and you know, it's about a day and a half of, uh, of time for our staff to, to work with them. Um, but we try to give as many options for people to interface with the organization as possible. Thanks. And then there's another question from AES. Has, have you done any work looking at how these badges or other awards impact or not impact broader participant outcomes, such as science literacy, knowledge of the system, support of science, et cetera? Um, 
I have not. I think that there's a lot of great researcher, researchers and um, fantastic people within our field that evaluate these types of things. Um, you know, I don't I haven't done any substantial studies that have said, yes, our volunteers have responded really well to receiving their certificates annually when they go through QAQC and stuff like that. Uh, we more do things word of mouth. Um, and then the other thing I didn't mention before is, um, you know, having surveys for our volunteers to fill out so that there is a feedback loop if they haven't come to meetings or something like that. It gives them a chance to, you know, give us feedback as to whether or not something feels good or not good within um, one of our monitoring programs. But that question sounds like a, a great, you know, question to explore through an NSF proposal or perhaps someone out there already has um, looked at these types of things. Does anybody else have questions? We have none queued up. So if anybody has any burning questions, we've got about five minutes left on the webinar and we're happy to, to get those up. Uh, I've got one here. So from Chelsea DeMarco, I'm a gradu graduate student uh, that just had a pilot season citizen science project. It was quite disorganized and many people were trained but did not participate. I'm not allowed, that's in quotes, uh, to survey the people who did not participate to ask why, but I am assuming it's due to the disorganization. Since last year, we have made tons of improvements. How do I try to recruit from the same interest group? Oh, man. So, I mean, I think that there is a learning curve with, you know, launching a new program. And with our shale gas program, we had a lot of learning curves because we didn't have the staff to manage the demand and things like that. So I think it's really important, um, Chelsea, that you had a pilot season. And I think that even within that first year, you know, make sure as you're going through your project to let people know that it is a pilot and, you know, we're using this as an opportunity to get feedback on how to, you know, roll this out at a larger scale. So um, I think for folks that if you're looking to recruit from the group of folks, the same group of folks, and people haven't come back to other events, um, you know, keep them on your list, but it might be the time to, you know, think of expanding your web um, and thinking through like, I don't know if this is in a specific locale, you know, you know, using some of those other recruitment strategies to try to get um, more people interface. But, you know, if someone comes to a training event, and we did this is with a lot of our workshops where, um, you know, people will come for the educational experience, but they don't always translate to volunteers. So again, not to keep citing our fracking monitoring program, but through that, we had close to 3,000 people come to workshops. And out of it, I think we had close to 250 volunteers as total. But not all those volunteers, like, you know, have monitored for five years. They've monitored for a discrete period of time. Um, so I, I think that that's common. And so, you know, yes, you know, people who come to a workshop might be interested later on. But if they don't, if they continually not show up, go for another pool of folks. Another question from Hillary is uh, one question, uh, sorry, one reason adoption of all best practices may not happen is capacity. All of these things take time and resources. I think a lot about the trade off between energy put into recruitment versus retention. Can you speak to Alarm's experience with that, prioritizing where to put energy if you can't do all the things? Oh, and you certainly cannot do all the things, Hillary, and that's certainly true. Um, so for us, we actually don't put as much time into recruitment, um, in part because of the model in which we work with volunteers tiers it's a community group and so it's a local community partner and so they're the folks who are going to be the connectors and know on the local basis who are the best people to be connected in with the project so we tend to put most of our resources into the training and making sure that people have quality assured confidence within their actual monitoring and then from there it's keeping people engaged um, you know baseline water quality monitoring can be uh, really exciting for some people but also can get really tiresome um, for some people over time and so you know thinking about you know different opportunities to keep people engaged so if you have someone doing chemical monitoring on a monthly basis you know making sure that they have the opportunity to come to that macroinvertebrate workshop or learn a new visual assessment technique or something like that and um, so for us, really, our time goes into retention and, you know, again, making sure that folks are collecting quality assured data. And Chris, if you have other stuff to add to that, go for it. So. Well, well, we're almost out of time and there's one more question. So I think I want to ask that question so we can give um, the 
all the questions get answered. So the, the question here is, do you have ideas for celebrating volunteers online? My network is statewide and nearly impossible to get people together in person. Yeah, um, so I think for something like that, again, you know, thinking through some of those database um, prompts, you know, where folks can be celebrated as they're entering data is really cool. But then the other thing to think about is like, perhaps you have a, a webinar that's only for like your top volunteers that have done you know, X kind of engagement with the organization. So it's like a sneak peek, like maybe you have a researcher within your department that had like found something really cool and you and they get to hear about it first. Um, I also think, you know, we are using the webinar function of Zoom, but Zoom also has that community function where everyone can be talking and you can have a meeting with a subset of people. I think keeping it to like 20 or less, you know, people can sign in and have a conversation. Um, I think there's a lot of great ways with technology today to be able to still be in the room with people um, without having to do all the traveling. Um, but yeah, I think thinking through, you know, the celebrations, those badges, those automatic prompts um, to celebrate their contribution, but also, you know, having the opportunity to sign into a webinar to hear about this new thing that you learned and discovered or, you know, to tell a story and, and stuff like that, just an opportunity to connect conference calls, I think, um, with a subset of your constituency is also a really great tool to get people on the horn and, and chat with each other and hear about each other's experiences. Those are all great. The one thing that I would add is people love to see their names in print. So if you have an electronic newsletter or if you tweet or Facebook, people love to see the recognition that um, of, of their work in that social media aspect or through your news that you get out. So thank you, thank you, Julie, the alarm director. Uh, I, I really appreciate your time. It was really a fantastic set of resources. We will be, this is a recorded webinar. We'll be getting it up on our Citizen Science Association website for um, our paid members. And then after six months, the, um, the, the non-paying members, folks who paid today, if you want to get access to it, contact um, the Citizen Science Association. We'll make sure that you have access to that. And I did want to put one more plug out for our next month's webinar series, uh, the number number two webinar uh, with Catherine Hoffman, uh, learning about the SciStarter program. So thanks, Julie. Thanks, everybody, for being on today. Uh, and um, have a great rest of the, uh, the month. Good holiday. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody, for joining today.